is anybody in heaven now? Yes, and this is where some people get confused. There are some people who are special examples that went to heaven. Bible tells who they are. In Mark chapter 9, verse 1 through 8, you can read it in Luke and Matthew also, it says, Jesus went up the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and Moses and Elijah appeared to him there and talked to him. Well, how did they get to heaven? Bible tells us. Elijah went to heaven in a fiery chariot. You know that song, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. My Bible says a band full of angels took him up to heaven. He did not die. And Moses got there. You can read in the book of Jude, verse 9, Michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses. And we believe this was about three days after the death of Moses. The Bible doesn't say three days. But uh, we do know that uh, it is in a Jewish tradition called the Assumption of Moses that three days later the Lord raised him so that Moses could witness the people crossing over into the promised land. have no reason to doubt that. But we know that he's in heaven. He talked to Jesus. And then Enoch walked with God and he was not. For God took him. And they walked together every day. And as one little girl put it, one day God said, Enoch, look, we're closer today to my house than your house. Just come home with me. And so he took him to heaven. And then at the crucifixion of Jesus, there was another special resurrection. Matthew 27, verse 52 and verse 53, when Christ died, it says and there was a great earthquake and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves when, after his resurrection, the earthquake shook some graves open, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, notice I'm backing up a slide. It says, and all of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep. Is that what it says? <clears throat> no, it says many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Not all. This was a small local resurrection that took place. Some of those who had been prominent in proclaiming Jesus might have been John the Baptist or Isaiah the prophet or some of the people who had died in the vicinity of Jerusalem. Jesus took a first fruits with him of the resurrection to heaven. But the general resurrection hasn't happened yet. And coming out of his grave, at the graves after his resurrection, people saw them. So question eight. But isn't it true that the soul is immortal and that only the body dies? What does the Bible say? Ezekiel 18.4 the soul that sins will die. I've stopped my message at this point in audiences with thousands of people. And I said, show me one verse in the Bible that says we have an immortal soul. Everyone looks around, waits for someone to say something because they've heard about it. They've heard sermons about it. They've sung songs about the immortal soul. They thought there must be a verse. No one raises their hand because there is no verse. John 3.16 for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Got two choices. Perish, death, or life. You don't get immortality without Jesus. The, let me give you some more verses on that. Someone says, well, yeah, the body dies, but the soul lives. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, fear not him who can destroy your body, but he can't hurt your soul. Jesus said, fear him who can destroy soul and body in hell. We'll mention that verse again tomorrow night. Shall mortal man be more just than God? Job asks in 4 verse 17. Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. The king of kings and lord of lords who only has immortality. And so the idea that we're all immortal souls, that is perpetuating the first lie that the devil ever told. What did God say in the Garden of Eden? Do not eat the forbidden fruit. If you eat the forbidden fruit in the day that you eat thereof, you will die. And the devil said, you will not die. And you notice he doesn't say you will not die. He says, you will not surely die. You don't really completely die. He says, you're going to live on. You're immortal. You live on in heaven or you live on in hell or, or you're going to be reincarnated. But the devil has told all these religions, you don't really die. You can marry another dead body in the next life. They get all kinds of ideas about what happens after you die. God only has immortality according to the Bible. Immortality is a gift given exclusively to those who are saved by Jesus. Everybody does not have it. When will the righteous be given immortality? The Bible says 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51 through 53 
we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. So when does this happen? Last trump. It's in the future. That's when we get the transformation. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And this mortal will put on immortality. When do we get immortality? You just read it. These aren't my words. And yet so much of the Christian world is, is t- teaching fairy tales. And you, know, you hear it all the time. Some famous person will pass away. And uh, not too long ago, I guess Robin Williams died. It was tragic. He took his life. And then everybody commenting on the news said, he is up in heaven telling God jokes right now. God is laughing. And uh, no, he's not. He's sleeping in the grave, waiting for the judgment day. The dead are waiting. They're sleeping. Immortality is not given uh, immediately to a person. When they die, they don't experience. They've got to wait till the resurrection for their immortal body. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. When? When the Lord descends from heaven with a shout. Let me look up another verse for you. I don't think I included in my presentation, so I want to read this to you. And this is from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. And this to me is is what you call a slam dunk scripture. If this isn't clear, then no amount of evidence will convince a person. Paul is trying to explain to the Corinthian church, they've got a lot of confusion about the resurrection and what happens and when it happens. He said, uh, for as in Adam all die. We all kind of inherited the, the, the natures of Adam. We've got these bodies that die. But even so in Christ, for those who are in Christ, all shall be made alive. But each one in its own order. Here's the order. Christ the firstfruits, Jesus was raised back 2,000 years ago. Afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming. So when do they rise? They haven't risen yet at his coming. But Pastor Doug, you're trying to tell me all these years, I, I've thought my mom, my dad, they're, they're up in heaven, grandma, grandpa, they're looking down on me. And I thought I sensed their presence. What was going on there? Well, and I sympathize with you. And, uh, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to discourage anybody. First of all, do you really want your, your loved ones looking down from heaven on what's going on here on earth and thinking about all the struggles you might be having? Uh, forgive me excuse me no well how would they enjoy heaven if they see you down here having a hard time that's not going to be heaven for them and just picture you know a, a young mother dies and she leaves some children behind and then the husband remarries and you got a wicked stepmother that beats the kids and she's up in heaven supposed to be having a good time and how would they enjoy that and they wouldn't be enjoying that very much no, they are resting in peace. But Brother Doug, you know, I, I, I lost my husband, my wife, and, and I sensed their presence. I sensed their near. And I felt like I was getting little messages. All of a sudden, I saw a text message on my phone, and I thought they were texting me. And I've heard all kinds of incredible stories. Well, you know, you may sense they're near. I know when my brother died. You know, he's an older brother, and he died when he was 35, and for all of my life, he was always there. And uh, it was just really odd. I had one brother. And it was so strange because now I couldn't talk to him. And I sometimes felt like I could just pick up the phone and call him. But you know, the thing is, my mind was so full of his memories. I've talked to widows. Married to someone, my grandparents were married 70 years. And more than that, 72 years. And uh, Karen's grandparents, how long? You're married. 72 years or something, Yeah. Interesting thing about her grandparents, they were afraid that one would die without the other. And they both died the same day in the same room with each other after being married. He was 100 and she was 96, 95, yeah. My grandparents married all that time and then, no, I'm okay, dear, thank you. She's offering me a cough drop again. (laughs) I'm all right, thank you. So, um, yeah, they, they, they sense this person's presence. And I spoke with one widow. You know, you spend all your life talking to a person and you're together and, and she said, you know, I get up and I say, Jack. And I go, oh, I forgot he's gone. And you've got, your mind is filled with those memories and that's normal. 
It doesn't mean that their spirit is there haunting or anything like that. You need to go by what the Bible says and not what you may sense or feel or even experience. How does the Bible repeatedly refer to death? Our friend Lazarus sleeps. Jesus said Lazarus is dead. He made it really clear. He told the disciples, Lazarus is sleeping. They said, oh, that's good, dear. Lord, he, he, he had a fever, and if he sleeps, he'll get better. And Jesus said, you don't get it. Lazarus is dead. Sleep is the word I use for dead. And then he said, but I'm going to wake him up. When he came to the grave, he asked the people to roll away the stone. And they didn't want to do it. They said, Lord, he's been dead four days. It's going to smell unpleasant at this point. They're being realistic. Jesus said, trust me. And then they rolled away the stone. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And someone said if he hadn't specified Lazarus, if Jesus had just said, come forth, every grave in the world would have opened up at that point. Lazarus came out, and he was still hobbled in his grave clothes. Now think about this. If a person dies and they go right to heaven, you'd think you know, four days would be enough time to get them there. And Lazarus, he dies. All of a sudden, he's up in heaven. And he's having fun, he's just in bliss, he's in glory, he's beaming with happiness, he's out of this sick body he was in. And, and then Jesus said, well, he's my friend, I'm bringing him back. Poof, he's back in the grave. He's in grave clothes, he's in this sinful world. Who would do that to their friend? Bring him out of heaven back to earth? No, that's not a friendly thing to do. And then here's the other thing. Don't miss this. There are about a dozen resurrections in the Bible. There's some in the Old Testament, Elijah resurrected a boy. Elisha resurrected a boy. Someone was resurrected on the bones of Elisha. In the New Testament, several resurrections. Paul may count as one because it says he was stoned and he just got up. Again, they thought he was dead. And so we don't know. The Lord might have said, since you guys aren't praying for his resurrection, I'm just going to raise him. So there's about a dozen resurrections in the Bible. Now, if that happened today, every media camera in the world, every agency would send, if someone had been dead four days, clinically dead, they would send a reporter and they would shove microphones in his face. The first question they'd ask is, where were you? What happened? What was it like? I'll tell you, for me, this is another slam dunk. There's not one person resurrected in the Bible that ever makes a single comment on what they experienced while dead. Why not? Someone's gonna say, what about the rich man and Lazarus parable? Send in that question. Maybe Pastor Ross and I will get to that after our presentation tonight. And the graves were opened when Jesus comes. Matthew 27, 52. And many of the bodies of the saints which slept rose. That's telling us about that exception. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. Them also that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. When the Lord comes back, the dead in Christ rise first, so they're with Jesus. Then we who are alive and remain are transformed, given glorified bodies, caught up to meet them in the air so together we go back to glory well, they don't go one by one checking in we're going as a victorious parade together back to the kingdom that God has made Amen. Psalm 13 verse 3 consider and hear me O Lord my God enlighten my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death death is a peaceful dreamless sleep we don't have to worry that uh, a person is conscious and haunting us when they die. They are unconscious until they are raised by the Lord in either the first or the second resurrection. Now, we've got a study coming. I think it's on Monday. We're talking about the millennium of Revelation 20. You'll want to come for that because we'll talk more about the different resurrections there. Since wizards, witches, and psychics cannot contact the dead, who are they contacting? They are the spirits of devils working miracles. Now, that's why this subject is so important to understand, friends. There's, we interviewed the people on the street. Notice how many of them thought, oh, yeah, I believe in ghosts. Only one I noticed said no. The rest of them, oh, yeah, there's this energy, there's forces. And they got programs on TV where someone says, I'm a specialist. I can cross over and communicate with the dead. And they've got... Uh, <laughs> I remember they had a psychic on TV for years that uh, said uh, they could communicate with the dead. And the first thing that you heard if you called their psychic hotline is, what is your credit card number? <laughs> and a friend, he was kind of quite a joker, he called that number. It was sister somebody. She was going to communicate with the dead for him. And they said, uh, 
said, can we have your credit card number? He said, well, if you're psychic, you tell me. <laughs> you, know, you ought to know that. I was uh, not far from here. There's a, a psychic establishment business in Rockland, and I drove by one day, and I wanted to take a picture for a slide program I was doing. She saw me out there with a camera, and she got nervous. And she came out, and she said, can I ask you what you're doing? I said, well, you're a psychic. You tell me. <laughs> That would have been a little cheeky, huh? Sorry. Anyway, but uh, yeah, the Bible says that the devil is going to try it. It's amazing how we learned that everybody, you know, it was in the news, Hillary Clinton, Nancy Reagan. I picked one Democrat, one Republican, so you won't think I'm being biased. But these are two first ladies that were admitting that they were consulting astrology and mediums to get information. And uh, it's kind of spooky says they go forth to the kings of the earth, leaders. You'd be surprised. Why does Satan want us to believe that the spirits of the dead are really alive? Well, because some people will have, they'll put more credibility in an apparition or a vision than they will in the word of God. There will arise false Christs and false prophets and they will show great signs and wonders. And Jesus says this deception is going to be so powerful inasmuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Christ said, behold, I've told you ahead of time. What will be more convincing in the last days than if Satan, of course, he's going to impersonate Christ before he comes back. But if all of a sudden people's dead ones begin to appear or um, resurrected spirits that say, I'm the Apostle Peter. How many people in the world pray to saints? Isn't that right? How many people in the world pray to Mary? Is there a single verse in the Bible that says that Mary's in heaven? I know this is going to shake some people's world, but if you want to go by the Bible, Mary's a godly woman. She is a saint as far as the biblical definition of a saint. I expect to see her in the kingdom. But nothing in the Bible says we should pray to her, yet there are apparitions of Mary that are taking place all over the world. And people go and they pray to these shrines and they're wanting her to speak to them. Well, if they say they're getting communication, who's talking to them? How easy is it for the devil to masquerade as the spirits of the dead? And does the devil, can, is he a, 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 an expert of illusion? Does he know what your grandma looked like? Does he know little secrets that only you and your grandma knew? Yeah. A little while ago, they had uh, a movie, Heaven is for Real, about this little boy who ostensibly died on the operating table. He came back and he saw heaven. He talked about heaven. And uh, yeah, it's, and everybody said, oh, you go on the internet, don't do it. But if you go on the internet, you'll find all these people who say, you know, I spent 20 minutes in hell. I spent half an hour in heaven. And everybody wants to know about it. And they're putting so much credibility in these people's experiences. Now, I don't want to question the sincerity of a boy that said, I saw these things, but can the devil re reveal information? Can God give you dreams? Yes. Can God speak through a donkey? Yes. Can the devil speak through a snake? Yes. Can the devil give dreams? Yes. Absolutely he can. Can he give you information? Yeah, he can impress things. I mean, how does the devil tempt us? It's through our spirit. He can give you information that people say, where'd they get that information? And it seems very compelling and very real. How effective will Satan's use of these evil spirits be in the last days? By thy sorceries were all nations deceived. This is Revelation 18.23, speaking about Babylon and the sorceries of Babylon. And there's a picture of... Uh, Babylon that you find in Revelation uh, chapter 17. This verse is from Revelation 18 verse 2. Babylon the great is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. There are good spirits. Those are angels. So if you, an angel leads you, that's good. Good angel. When it talks about foul spirits, these are talking about evil spirits. Demons that are masquerading. They're pretending to be departed loved ones and They'll know all. I heard a story one time where this, this lady, she lived in San Francisco, and I, admittedly, this is an anecdotal story, but uh, she lived in San Francisco. Her son was in Vietnam, and she got that terrible message that every parent would dread 
that uh, said, we regret to inform you that your son is uh, missing in action and presumed dead. And she was absolutely heartbroken and she locked her door and didn't go anywhere for days and she was just grieving the loss of her son. She had no husband at the time. And um, then one day she opened her eyes and at the end of her bed was her son standing there. And he's wearing a white robe and says, Mother, don't worry about me. I'm okay. I'm in a better place. And she was shocked by that because she was a Christian. He made no profession of being a Christian. Indeed, she was really worried about his behavior since he joined the military. He had kind of gotten into drinking and carousing and she was so worried that he had died lost. He said, don't worry, I'm fine. He said, God is good. These things about hell are not real. Everyone's going to make it. And she, she was talking to him and he's talking back to her. She's having this experience and she felt some comfort from it, but she was very uneasy because she understood the dead were dead. Well, this happened for several nights. He appeared in her room. And then a couple of days after that, doorbell rang and she opened the door and there was a son, but he's now standing in uniform and his arms in a sling. And she said, what are you doing at the door now? He said, aren't you happy to see me? And she realized it was really her son, flesh and blood. And then she realized, what was that that was appearing to me? He said, well, it wasn't me. Something was appearing to her. And you wonder if the devils got their database mixed up that they were masquerading. But you see how quickly the devil can try to deceive. Revelation 12, 9. That old serpent called the devil and Satan that deceives the whole world. So what is the, one of the principal ways Satan is going to seek using false prophets, false Christs to deceive the whole world in the last days? It's going to be the same thing that the devil did with the king of Israel. Don't forget what it said there in uh, Revelation chapter 16. Three unclean spirits out of the mouth of the beast, the dragon, false prophet, go forth to the kings of the earth to deceive them and gather them together to this battle against God's people. Evil spirits are going to be involved. Christians need to know what does the Bible teach about death. Our loved ones are sleeping a beautiful, peaceful, dreamless sleep and we don't need to be concerned about them. Number 14, how does God regard these miracles by evil angels? Should Christians ever dabble in that realm of darkness? Leviticus 20 verse 27, a man also or a woman that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. Now I'm not recommending that we resurrect the Salem witch trials. As we don't live under a theocracy, but this is how strongly God felt about witchcraft. This is what the Levitical law said. They were not to be turning to the witches and the mediums and the spiritists as the heathen did. Some will depart from the faith, 1 Timothy 4.1, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It breaks my heart when I hear about Christians that say, yeah, I've got an astrologist that's guiding me. Or that, you know, there's a medium that's, t I'm communicating with this dead loved one. And, and uh, it's, the Bible says, stay away from this. Ephesians 5 verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. God wants us to completely avoid that realm. Galatians 5, 19 and 20, the works of the flesh which are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, notice, witchcraft. And he's saying this is one of the works of the flesh. And trying to consult with the dead is all in that same category. You know, if you're a believer, you don't have to be afraid of death. The Bible says, he that has the son has life. He that has not the son has not life. Do you know, you cannot kill a Christian. Christians don't die. Christians go to sleep. When they stoned Stephen, it says, he gave up the ghost. He went to sleep. And, you know, we, we all know, we don't, people don't like to think about death. God's wired us to want to be alive and stay alive. But for the Christian, really, uh, we ought to be thinking about the life that lasts forever. We get so preoccupied with the temporary life here, we forget the one that's really going to last. And Paul said, I'm at a, in a struggle. He said, I, I, he was in prison waiting for execution. He says, I can't wait to go and be with the Lord. Meaning his next thought, he's going to be resurrected and be with the Lord. And he said, but I need to stay here and try and encourage you. And he says, I'm torn between the two. He was almost excited about it. 
Paul said, rejoice. Jesus said, when you're persecuted for righteousness, sake, rejoice. If a person's lived a godly life, they have nothing to fear. I remember, you know, let's all face it. We've all been at some funerals where there may have been some doubt. No one ever says anything bad at a person's funeral. Well, usually they don't. You've got to be careful when you hand around the microphone at a funeral. You never know what exactly someone's going to say. But um, usually people are very gracious, and uh, you, we try to be as comforting and positive as you can be, and that's the way it should be. But every now and then I've done a funeral where I know that person's going to be in the kingdom. I remember I was asked to do the funeral for the, the wife of the pastor who baptized me. They studied with me, Mrs. Phillips, godly woman. Lived in 93, woke up that morning, did her Bible study. Her Bible was open. She underlined the verse that said, we shall not die. She went out in the garden, she had a stroke, and, and uh, she died. And uh, I did her funeral, and there she was in the coffin. You know, sometimes they've got the body in the coffin below the pulpit, and you're preaching, and, and I saw her there, and she looked so peaceful. I was jealous. I thought to myself, the next thing she's going to experience is going to be coming out of the grave. She's not going to be 93. She's going to have a, a painless, glorified body full of vitality. She'll be beautiful, be rejoined with her husband, and lost a baby in the mission field, be reunited with a baby. And I thought, boy, wow, she is in, she is in line for some real excitement. Her next thought, and I was jealous. I was thinking, I wish I could trade places with her. Because, you know, what could be more valuable than to know that you're going to sleep in Christ? And, uh, you know, I think this is just, it's, it's really encouraging for a believer to remember that. If you've got Jesus, you don't have to be afraid of death. The Bible tells us sorcerers will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone that is the second death. But what glorious power does God offer his people? Jesus said, in, or Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. We all want to experience that power. You know, the uh, eternal life for a Christian does not begin in the resurrection. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He that has the Son has life. That begins now. And so when we accept Jesus, our eternal life begins. We may have our old bodies but he that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life. And you know, in closing this segment, friends, I'd like to just encourage you all to make that decision to say, I want to have Jesus. I want to have that life. And invite him into your heart and in your life. Would you like to accept Jesus' offer to give you the power of the resurrection in your life? He will make you a new creature. You will experience that new birth. There's a resurrection that happens even now where you're born again and you become a new creature. And that gives you the confidence that you have nothing to fear of death.